Welcome to EM Cases Rapid Reviews, where we review the take-home points from the EM Cases main episode podcasts so you can ace your exams and take stellar care of your patients. Hello everyone, I'm Nick Claridge and welcome to another edition of Emergency Medicine Cases Rapid Review. In this video, we're going to take a look at a common presenting complaint, vaginal bleeding in early pregnancy and give you some pearls and pitfalls to help you out with your next patient. We're going to review a differential diagnosis, key features of the history and physical exam, highlight some important numbers with the beta HCG, and finally, we will talk about some specific conditions, including molar pregnancy and spontaneous abortion. But we'll leave ectopic pregnancy for the second half of this video series. Let's start with a case. You have a G1P0 at six weeks coming in with vaginal bleeding. Really common, right? She's spotting for the last week and has some cramping today, so she came to the emergency department. So far, the pregnancy is uncomplicated, but she's worried that she might be having a miscarriage. So first, let's lay down a differential. We're emergency physicians, so obviously, intuitively, we all think about ectopic pregnancy. And we probably should, because it carries a 10% mortality risk. The other diagnosis that quickly comes to mind is spontaneous abortion. And this is what most patients are going to be worried about. Another you have to consider is anembryonic pregnancy, formerly known as blighted ovum. And this is where you have a gestational sac, but no fetal pole or visible yolk sac. There's also non-obstetrical causes, such as vaginal lacerations, neoplastic polyps, or fibroids. And finally, one that is difficult to remember is gestational trophoblastic disease, or molar pregnancy. Knowing this differential, there are some key elements of the history and physical that we have to hit. First, with any type of bleeding, we want to quantify it. Next, we want to figure out if the pain is lateralizing or central. Then we want to take a good obstetrical history, including previous miscarriages and fertility history, particularly asking about IVF treatment. I think a big question a lot of physicians have is whether to do a pelvic exam or not. Our experts suggest that if the ultrasound findings are available and reassuring, then a pelvic exam may be deferred. But if a high quality ultrasound is not available or not definitive and reassuring, then a pelvic exam is required to assess the uterus and adenexa. I think we all know to order a beta HCG, but it's important to stress that all women of childbearing age should get this test, regardless if the history suggests of a possible pregnancy and even in patients who have a tubal ligation. Here are a couple important numbers that you're going to want to remember about the beta HCG. It should double every 48 to 72 hours, but this is not cut and dry. Very early on in pregnancy, it may double quicker than later in pregnancy, so don't hang your hat on this doubling time. The levels usually become positive 8 to 11 days after conception, and these will peak at roughly 10 to 12 weeks, then gradually decrease. Now this is important. The urine beta HCG becomes positive one week after the serum tests, and it may be falsely negative, especially if the urine is dilute. So don't rely on a urine beta. Always get a serum. Keep in mind that an intrauterine pregnancy should be visible transvaginally if the beta HCG is greater than 1500, and should be visible transabdominally if greater than 3000. The most common diagnosis you're going to make is a spontaneous abortion, and there are several different types, so let's review quickly. When differentiating the types, is it important to know if the cervix is open or closed and whether there are still products of conception within the uterus. In a threatened abortion, there's vaginal bleeding, the cervix is closed, and there's no evidence of fetal demise on the ultrasound. The risk of complete is roughly 50%, but if there's a fetal heart rate, then this decreases to about 5%. In inevitable, there's bleeding with an open cervix and the products of conception are not yet expelled, and almost all of these progress to complete. For incomplete, there's vaginal bleeding, the cervix is open, and the products of conception are not completely expelled, and this is based on ultrasound or exam. For complete, the bleeding is usually minimal, the os is closed, and the products are expelled from the uterus. But just keep in mind ectopic pregnancies in these cases, as they can look very similar. Lastly, in missed abortion, there may or may not be bleeding, and the ultrasound shows fetal demise, but the products remain in the uterus. One more to mention is septic abortion, which is rare and the result of pelvic instrumentation and may be mistaken as PID. So if we have a stable patient, what options do we have? One is expectant management. Two 
is medical management with vaginal mesoprostol, which encourages the passage of products. And finally, there's surgical management, which is a DNC. A huge component of this is addressing psychological concerns. So use sensitivity and empathy. Acknowledge distress and grief and reassure the patient that neither she nor her partner did anything to cause the miscarriage and there's no increased risk of miscarriages in the future. What if they're unstable? Always go back to the ABCs, get the patient to the recess room, attach them to the monitor, get vascular access and give IV fluids and anticipate the need for uncross-matched O-negative blood. Remember to place a Foley catheter and get on the phone with your local obstetrician. But that's not all. You can also give transesthemic acid and if you need to, oxytocin. The way we give this is by adding 40 to 20 units into a 1 liter bag of normal saline and running it at 150 cc's per hour. Be careful not to give it as a bolus, as this can itself can cause hypotension. And if you have to give a bolus of fluids, make sure you use a different normal saline bag. With an unstable vaginal bleed, you should be doing a pelvic exam, as you want to identify the source of bleeding and extract any tissue found in the cervix. This brings us to our last item on the differential, a molar pregnancy. So what is a molar pregnancy? Well, these are tumors that arise from fertilization of the ovum and an overproliferation of trophoblastic tissue. This usually presents as vaginal bleeding and an ultrasound that shows this snowstorm appearance. But remember, an ultrasound is not sensitive for a molar pregnancy in the first trimester. And interestingly, patients may present with preeclampsia or hyperthyroid symptoms due to the very high beta-HCG. So if you see a beta-HCG in the first trimester over 100,000, you should think about it. Another pearl is that due to the, gener the generation of reactive cysts, they can also present with ovarian torsion. The treatment for molar pregnancy is surgical and includes a workup for metastatic disease. So to recap, remember to go through a differential, keep in mind the key points on history and physical. For a beta, always get a serum, don't rely on a urine. If you're diagnosing a complete abortion, keep in mind an ectopic pregnancy and think about molar pregnancy with a very high beta HCG. Thanks everyone for listening and see you again next time where we'll review ectopic pregnancy.